National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having farmers receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century. NFO Collective Bargaining for Agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents Cheap Food Means Hungry People with Monsignor O'Rourke, Director of National Catholic Rural Life, Des Moines, Iowa. Here now is W.W. W. Swaim, National Director of NFO Research and Public Information. It's a pleasure to visit with you in your home at this time and discuss some of the things that faces the world and America, especially the United States. It's a pleasure to have as my guest today, Monsignor O'Rourke, the National Catholic Rural Life uh, of the nation, headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa. And I would like to ask you, Monsignor O'Rourke, why does a priest become concerned over uh, the cheap food makes hungry people? Thank you, uh, Mr. Swain. During the past seven years, it's been my privilege to serve as the director of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, an organization that's not interested primarily in the worship or the uh, uh, theology of the church, but rather the application of religion to the practical affairs of daily life. And in this connection, obviously, we're concerned with justice to all sectors of our economy. And since ours is a rural organization, we're concerned with fair prices for farmers on the other hand, it's been my privilege in recent years to travel rather widely, both in representing the National Catholic Rural Life Conference overseas and another fine organization for which I work, the International Voluntary Services. So I've seen people who are hungry to the point of death and must, of course, be deeply concerned. And also, it seems to me that it is the responsibility of groups such as ours to do something about these problems, both at home and abroad. Uh, Monsignor O'Rourke, uh, is there any opposition between the desire for a good price for the food producers and uh, or cheap food policy, and then the people that sell the food? Uh, is there? Tell us a little about the conflict. Well, there would seem at first glance to be a conflict, Mr. Swain. It seems that if the price of food goes up, the uh, uh, costs to the hungry people go up also, and obviously their food dollar would go not so far. I think the first, but perhaps not the most important answer, is the fact that only 38 cents out of the food dollar currently reaches the farmer, and therefore improving the price to the farmer does not necessarily mean a very substantial increase in the price of food. I think you too have some thoughts along those lines. Yes, and I have, uh, Monsignor, I have a chart here that shows what's happened to the food cost, the retail food prices, and the prices received by the farmer. If the camera would move in close here, and pretty soon I want to get back to your uh, overseas uh, international voluntary services. I want to get back to that, but while we're talking about the prices, I would like to show here, if you'd come in close enough, please, that they could see the lines on this chart. And the top line that goes along here are the retail food prices. The retail food prices, the price that the American consumer is paying. The lower line is the price that the farmer is receiving for the same food. Now, you'll notice that 47 through 49, those lines were pretty well in balance, and they're supposed to stay right together, or nearly together, all the time, right along together. But you'll notice that the prices to the retail trade began to go up and the prices to the farmer began to go down. And all along the line, and Wallace Farmer had this to say about it, if farm prices rise, which they did here, food prices invariably follow. That's shown up very clearly here. If farm prices are stable, food prices rise. Farm price is stable, the food price rises. If farm prices go down, food prices rise usually. And this is what's happened. So it's a real conflict. And then in this year, 1940 or 67, they're expecting the food prices to go up to the consumer 
one and a half to two and a half percent, and down to the farmer anywhere from two to three percent. So you see that the statement that you made, that just because it went up to the farmer doesn't necessarily, and this is most certainly true, this chart will show, if the farmer is going to get up there, his prices could come up a long ways all over the world and not raise the price of food much. And this happens to be the chart on the United States. Mr. Swain, this then suggests a second and main point I would like to make, namely that almost all of the people in these hungry nations are farmers. And if they ever hope to have a better way of life and enter in any sense into 20th century living, they too must have better prices for what they sell. First of all, they must be helped to increase their production so that they will have something to sell. And as they do enter into commerce in the uh, modern sense of the word, they're going to be more deeply concerned with fair prices than the American farmer is because their need is more desperate. I think this is very true. And the point that you brought out, that they must have a price if they're going to proceed into the 20th century, in other words, if they're going to progress as a nation, this is so true, and it's borne out by a lot of facts. The long-time records of the United States government prove conclusively that each dollar of gross farm income, each dollar that we pay the farmer for uh, his production, multiplies or generates seven dollars into seven dollars of earned national income. And this is the reason, Monsignor, that India, for instance, has such low income and haven't progressed and are not able to even buy the tools of production, not able to even feed their own people. And they're starving today. I have here a recent uh, article on that pointing out that in India, right now, they're having famine strikes. They're blocking the trains and the trucks to get more food and things of this nature. And the cost or the fact that brought this about was the fact that the income on India is only about $70 per person because they underpaid India for its raw materials all these years. May I build on that, please, Mr. Swain? First of all, I think we have to see how close the uh, problem of the farmer in America is with, let us say, the whole nation of India and the other developing countries. By and large, the farmer sells food and other raw materials, fiber and so forth. Uh, so also, the people in these developing nations who enter only very insignificantly into uh, manufacturing and that kind of industry, they too, as a whole nation, not just as one sector of the economy, uh, are dependent upon the price of raw materials and of agricultural products for their national prosperity. I have here, and I think this might relate, uh, the encyclical by Pope Paul VI on the development of peoples issued just a very few weeks ago, in which he elaborates this thought, I think, rather uh, forcefully. He says in the 57th paragraph, highly industrialized nations export for the most part manufactured goods, while countries with less developed economies have only food, fiber, and other raw materials to sell. As a result of technical progress, the value of manufactured good is rapidly increasing and they can always find an adequate market. On the other hand, raw materials produced by underdeveloped countries are subject to wide and sudden fluctuations in price, a state of affairs far removed from the progressively increasing value of industrial products. As a result, nations whose industrialization is limited are faced with serious difficulties when they have to rely on their exports to balance their economy and to carry out their plan for development. The poor nations remain ever poor while the rich ones become still richer. Right, and I would like to add a little to that, uh, Monsignor. Uh, the rich nations of the world, considered to be uh, Europe, including USSR, Russia, in other words, North America from the Mexican border on up, uh, Australia and New Zealand and Japan, there are 900 million people living in those countries. And in the poor countries, there are two and a half billion people in the poor countries, mainly in the southern hemisphere, including the mainland of China and India. In the rich countries, the average income per person is $1,170.
per year. In the poor countries, the average is $110, which backs up what you said, that they have a hard time getting by, and they must put a better price on their raw materials also. The gap between the richer and the poor nations, uh, the richest and the poorest nation, on the other hand, the United States has a per capita income in 1960 of $2,300, while in India, they generated only $70 of income per capita. And this is why they're starving and not producing enough food. May I then build on that too, please, Mr. Swain? Uh, it stands to reason that unless the people have something to sell, no matter what the price, they are in a bad way. Now, it has been my privilege to do some development work in agriculture and community life in some of these struggling nations. And let me at least very briefly give the uh, audience and, and the TV uh, stations uh, some idea of how this proceeds. I'm sure almost all have had some reports along these lines, but I have some very vivid recent memories. Just a few days ago, I was down in the lower West Indies in an island called Cariacu, about 200 miles north of Venezuela. And there on the jetty at the main harbor of this little island, I saw boxes of dried codfish that had been shipped more than 4,000 miles from Canada down to an island that's surrounded by waters in which there are hundreds of thousands of tons of the finest fish in the world. Now, what is the problem? Well, this is a problem that grew over the years. These fishermen, and there are many on the island, have no motors for their boats. They can go out only so far as they can dare to row in that rather rough sea. They have no nets. They must fish with line and hook. When they catch their fish, they must sell them that day because they have no way of preserving them. Now, one of the immediate and obvious answers is to help these people form a cooperative so that they can purchase and utilize motors for boats and nets and cold storage and modern ways of uh, uh, marketing their fish so that someday when I return to the jetty at Karakou, I hope to see many, many boxes of fish and canned fish not being shipped into Karakou but being shipped out. Again, I think of a situation down in Yucatan down in southern Mexico, which I recently saw. Here's a little cooperative of farmers. They decided that their ancient way of farming was not adequate to produce the corn and beans and other things that they needed and wanted to sell. And they were persuaded to form a cooperative. And they resolved to work together on a little piece of land and make it a showpiece for themselves and for all of the other farmers on the, in the community. And it was our privilege to make available to them certain little tools, for example, a sprayer with which they could put insecticides on their crops and to spray uh, uh, folio fertilizers on their crops. And you see, they, these sound like little things, but you add this up by the thousand and realize that in each of these instances, we're helping people help themselves, not just bringing relief to them, and we're building their courage and their determination and we begin to see that it is possible to enable these people to produce more. But this then, Mr. Swain, brings us back, and I think this is your field more than mine. How will we help them and the farmers of America get a better price? Well, I firmly believe, Monsignor Rourke, that, that the farmers of America can be helped mostly through collective bargaining program. Everyone's talking more muscle in the marketplace more bargaining power for American farmers, and it's been far too long that they haven't had this bargaining power. But it seems as though when they begin to get in position maybe to get a price, why they begin to import uh, more food into this country, and this is only natural, even though we don't need it so badly because we are the high market of the world. But uh, I think that we're going to have to organize collectively and get together sort of a big co-op, as you spoke about. Uh, collective bargaining is nothing more than a form of a co-op, people cooperating together and working for one thing, bargaining for a price. And I think that great strides have been made in this, and I know that many others in the world are looking for this at the same method. For instance, you might be interested to know, Monsignor, that uh, the European Common Market has visited our national office three times, uh, and they're very much concerned they would like to use collective bargaining on their livestock uh, to get them a better price. They have government help on the other. 
Uh, what is your idea of what needs to be done? Well, may I say, first of all, that your observation that the uh, bargaining of which you speak is very much similar to the cooperative approach that we usually use when we go into a developing nation, of this I'm very conscious. If I go, for example, from a meeting in Minnesota, as I uh, recently attended, where we were talking about bargaining by the American farmer, and a few days later go, let us say, into Vietnam or Laos or India or wherever it may be and speak of these very elementary kinds of cooperatives, it doesn't take a great shift of, of orientation of mind. They are basically the same things. If people will learn to use their resources and work together and to live in a cooperative way, we can solve our problems. I would like, however, to uh, respond also to something you mentioned a moment ago about the importation of dairy products. There seems again to be a conflict here. Any restriction of imports by a very wealthy and powerful nation like ours might seem to only intensify the problems of the struggling farmer, let us say, in another nation. And to a certain extent, I would agree to that view. I am certainly of the opinion that as a general policy, it is better for all peoples if we lessen as much as we can the artificial barriers to trade, because in the long run, a lively trade means a better way of life for all people. However, in recent months, we have witnessed here in the United States a kind of phenomena in the dairy importation business that I feel is disorderly and, for that reason, hurtful to all concerned. Uh, dairy products have been brought in that, for some technical reason, were not subject to importation quotas, but easily substituted for those that were dairy products, that some of which at least were produced under sanitary conditions that were quite different from and quite inferior to those uh, required by uh, the, of the American farmer. And therefore, I feel that legislation to restore order and fair play in this particular sector of international trade is needed. In the meanwhile, I reaffirm my contention that uh, as a general policy, uh, a lively and growing world trade is very, very important. I think, Monsignor, what we need, really, we hear so much about free trade. I think what we need is equity of trade. We need, if we actually need the product, we need to pay the other country so that those farmers could benefit and that they would be able to buy other commodities back and raise their standard of living. I think it's equity of trade that we need, and I think you would agree with me on this situation. And talking about the imports of dairy, uh, in 1966, we imported enough dairy commodities into the United States to put 6,000 50 cow producers out of business in America. And you pointed out another thing. It isn't fair to the American producer to expect him to buy high-priced machinery, keep the standards way high on his production, the bacteria count down, and then turn around on the other hand, at, this of course would be a fabulous cost to him, it cost, all this machinery cost a lot of money, and then on the other hand to import it from standards that aren't even halfway up to that normal. So I think this uh, is a two-way street on, on some of those things. Most certainly we need to import uh, some commodities, but most certainly we need to pay those people a fair price for it. Mr. Swain, I gather from this and previous conversation that you and your organization uh, ask the farmers to help themselves and only very rarely turn to the government for help. But do you ever find that sometimes government action interferes with your operations? I heard that, for example, of an action by the Justice Department against the National Farmers Organization during one of its holding actions. Do you have any comment about that that you'd like to offer? Well, of course, uh, the, the government claimed that one department claimed they didn't know anything about it. I mean, uh, the President of the United States claimed he didn't know anything about it. The Secretary of Agriculture, we know he took the side of the farmer. But it seems real strange that two departments that are directly under the President of the United States, it seems strange that one would take one side and one the other side and the President of the United States not know anything about it. And I think definitely that in a very short while we would have won this milk action and we would have been receiving prices. It stopped all of our bargaining efforts for just a few hours, 48 uh, to 72 hours, which is enough 
that some of the others backed out that were in the notion of signing contracts that would have assured the farmers a price. We did, however, though, in the milk holding action, we did gain uh, at least 50 cents a hundred in most marketing areas for the summertime months, and it remains to be seen what the price will do later on in the fall as a result of the milk holding action. So many people uh, don't realize the gains that we did made, make. But I think the government should have given the farmers a free hand to try to get a price. I think that you pointed out that you looked over the injunction, and, and what's your observation on it? As you pointed out, uh, you called me one day on the telephone. Well, it seems to me that it is absolutely essential that the farmer have the ability to bargain with other farmers and one farm organization collaborate with another farm organization in order that they may have some voice in the price of their commodity. Now, if it's really true that the present law under which this bargaining takes place, namely the Capra Volstead Act, does not permit that kind of activity by farmers and farmers' organization without violating the provisions of the Sherman Antitrust Act, then I would say let us modify the uh, Capra Volstead Act to make feasible this most important activity by farmers and their organization. Well, you see, the reason they gave for the injunction, of course, uh, as under the Capra Volstead Act, as producers and producers only, the farmer can go together, he can hold his milk, he can set a price for it, and he can get that price. But he isn't, it isn't legal for him to ask others to cooperate. And this is the reason, Monsignor, while we're on this subject, that none of the other farm organizations have been able to do it. But should they keep, if they would keep their own farm and organization and get together in a bargaining structure of producers and producers only, it would be legal. We could solve the problem almost overnight. Uh, just the same way that the dairy co-ops can solve the problem for dairy farmers by forming a marketing agency in common so that they market their products through this one agency. Then it becomes a legal structure. And this is the term. Now, uh, some people accused us of helping or asking others to help, which this would be illegal. We ask the farmers of America to join the National Farmers Organization and then support our efforts. But some of the people had this confused, and they accused our members of asking them to cooperate when they weren't a member. Well, this is why the cause for the injunction. May I return now, please, before our time runs out, to the main theme of our program, namely that uh, cheap food uh, means hungry people. As I observe the current uh, scene here in rural America and over the world, and I see many, many thousands of and millions of hungry people, and still some of the productive agricultural resources of the United States not being utilized, and it seems to me that one of the reasons that it is not utilized is that we have an antiquated marketing system which frightens the farmer in the sense that if he produced that abundance that would be needed to help the people overseas in the present marketing situation, this would probably have a devastating effect upon farm prices and perhaps put the farmer out of business. So it seems then, again, if we really mean business here, both at home and abroad, we must take a very hard look at our present marketing system. This is absolutely true. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture said not too long back that if farm prices do not rise, uh, if farm, farm income doesn't improve, the nation's family farm system will be uh, disappear and be replaced by a monolithic corporate farming operation that could conceivably control the food supply so that they could get any price they want. So it's real important, I think, that we do something about the marketing system as family farmers, keep the family farm in business so that they can provide food for the hungry overseas. Now, would you like to uh, make a statement here? We're getting close to the end of our period. Take all the time you want because I've done most of the talking up to now. May I say that, as we said at the outset, uh, by reason of my office with the National Catholic Rural Life Conference and as a citizen of the United States, I am deeply in admiration of the farmers of America and prize very highly the family farm system. I think it's an excellent way to produce food, that the family farm is a tremendous environment for family and particularly for children. And since it is necessary that the farmer have an adequate income, if this system is to be preserved, I urge all farmers to do their part 
together to get a price for themselves. And again, as I see firsthand and hear the cries of the hungry people in other countries, their faces haunting me often at night, and knowing that the causes of hunger are very complex and certainly related to the topic that we're discussing here today, I urge that all of us be alerted to the needs of these people and not to take a superficial view, but to help these people help themselves and to do things like improving the agricultural price and to provide the guidance that will form and strengthen cooperative and other self-help organizations so that someday these people too can stand on their own two feet and support the children they bear and whom they love and become a part, a healthy and happy part of the family of nations. Uh, just a moment here, Monsignor, uh, looking ahead in some recent figures that I have here on the international scene, the threat of widespread famine is validated by a glance at the future projections of population figures and the world food needs. At the present annual growth rate of 2% a year, world population, now over 3 billion people, 3 billion will double within a generation and zoom to 24 billion people within the next century. Now, the next 100 years or slightly more than a lifespan. So most certainly that we must be concerned about feeding these people. We must start now. We can't wait any longer. The underdeveloped countries now have an annual food grain deficit. And I get the point that I said grain because grain will take care of more people than meat will. It's a cheaper diet and it can, they can get by. But the deficit is now 16 uh, million tons. This deficit will increase to 42 million tons by 1975 and skyrocket to 88 million tons in 1985. This is why we must do something. Recognizing the seriousness of the impending world food crisis, we firmly believe that the United States cannot play an effective role in feeding the hungry world unless American agriculture is assured that its productive efforts will be rewarded. Present low farm income is wiping out the family farm at a fantastic rate. They're getting much older. The average age of farmers is 51, with two and four tenths million of them over 55. So we're going to have to do something now we're going to have to organize and solve our problems together. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has presented Cheap Food Means Hungry People with Monsignor O'Rourke, Director of National Catholic Rural Life, Des Moines, Iowa, and W.W. Swaim, NFO National Director of Research and Public Information. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The National Farmers Organization has been recognized as the leadership of agriculture and represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers.